Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mick Bikhamian, director of the Los Angeles Chess Club. So this is month of last Tuesday of February 2017. And tonight in the advanced class lecture, I have two games to show against two senior masters. One of them is a former student of mine, Joshua Shank, whose rating is higher than mine now. And uh, I just have the honor of never lost to him, Every, even if after he made senior master and we played several t games against each other. Another one against one of my nemesis is in Texas named Bill Ruder. He's also a senior master. So first game I'll be going over Joshua's game, Joshua Sheng. I was black, he played e4, and against my strongest competition I usually play my main line against e4 which is French. Uh, Sicilian is perfectly good, it's just not my cup of tea and it takes a different personality to play Sicilian than French. If you're a go-getter type personality, aggressive, super aggressive you have, like Kasparov, definitely Sicilian is for you. If you're more prudent, conservative, uh, no risk taker, French might be best for you. California's highest rated player, GM Varujan Akobian, also plays French defense. So French, uh, there is something and all the aggressive E4 players in history, like Tall, Fischer, Kasparov, they hated French defense. For good reason, because very resilient. If Black knows what he's doing, it's very hard to break through. And some of these guys' worst losses are against French. So, he played D4, I played D5, and he played the Knight D2 variation. Anybody knows the name of this line? Tarash against French. So there are two lines at this point. What I like about French is that it's black who imposes his line to white. So not only we are playing French, but also black can choose. There are two main lines at this point, tactical c5 or the positional knight f6. Well, my days of wild and crazy tactical player is over. So years ago, I switched to positional. So I like positional lines. One of the features of positional continuations or openings is a locked up pawn center. So nothing is going to take place within the next 10 moves or so as far as exchanges usually. And both sides maneuver their pieces around for jockeying for best squares. So after e5, black plays knight d7, and white opts for the most aggressive setup, bishop d3. This is by far the most popular continuation, even though knight gf3 is also playable. So bishop d3, he played. And if you don't know the theory of the opening, sometimes knowing general knowledge of chess will help you. For example, you see black has a pawn chain heading towards the queen's side. That indicates that black sh black's strength is on the queen's side and he should expand on that side and attack. White, because of this little pawn chain, which later on becomes bigger pawn chain, that means he should expand on the king's side, and white's strength is on the king's side of the board. So with that line drawn, black plays c5, and generally white keeps two pawns here at all times. So c3, knight c6, and what should white do now? We have two knights fighting over one square. So knight gf3 is playable, but it's not as popular. But knight e2, with the idea of this knight coming to f3, makes good harmonious developing move. So white played knight e2. Now it's black to play now, and the theory considers pawn takes, pawn takes, f6. And pretty much white has to capture again as the best continuation for black. There's an old line in this variation called Leningrad dot, Leningrad French, and that was knight b6. The idea of this move is to play bishop d7, bring the queen out, or maybe even lock up the center, and castle long. That was an old way of playing chess. Very tedious, very long, and in the long run, black always, almost always suffers. And the statistic is heavily in white's favor in this line. And this is the move that 
a local IM, Tim Taylor, played against an eight-year-old in Yugoslavia, and he ended up losing the game. So imagine the guy who won the US Open over 40 years ago, he played a line that he didn't know how to play, and the, the saddest part was that after he lost the game and he was coming down from the stairs, the eight-year-old goes, Mr. Mr., do you want me to show you how to play this line? Where you went wrong? And he was always t terribly dejected, so he said, no, thank you, and left. That eight-year-old was Magnus Carlsen that beat him. But this line, it just is not as good. So the continuation that black played here is c takes d4, c takes d4, and now we have this little pawn chain here. Nimzowicz said, attack the base of the pawn chain. This is over 78 years ago. Uh, but this base is, can easily be defended by white with knight f3, knight b3, bishop e3 later. So sometimes, and this is, uh, goes against the rules, the modern treatment of locked up center sometimes is to attack the front of the pawn chain. This move explains why because black, this knight is not well placed right now. If he takes and black takes with a knight, knight comes to a fantastic square. Granted that black has a backward pawn on an exposed file. You know, I was always told that you never push the f pawn until after you castle. Oh, we don't have and never in chess. <coughs> so you got to be very open minded. Times, there are times you do things that you're supposed to go against the rules. So, but. Uh, after pawn takes, knight takes, the reason you, uh, black is safe is because immediately puts a knight here, immediately put the, puts a bishop here, and castles. And he uses this, this half open f file to attack. Now, this is the moment that at least three, four times in tournaments, my opponents have gone wrong. And they made this good looking move. And this move has a tactical flaw to it. Anybody knows the problem with this move? It looks good. It strengthens this outpost, but there's a tactical problem with this move. F takes E and then a check by the queen of H4. Okay, F takes. F takes is the most sensible continuation. And then knight, knight And queen knight check knight. doesn't work because of G3. And where does the queen go? H3. Yeah, you can come over here, but he can easily kick the queen with say move like this and the queen is almost trapped so black has to be careful why uh, why can't he take d4 with the knight and because then check the queen, queen is hanging no earlier and then check you're with right the queen and right then, then instead of queen out early just take the knight, the knight in this position now knight takes pawn now and then if he takes with the knight you check him and take the knight exact knight takes queen check but believe it or not, this is a gambit line. In oh, other words, sometimes white it. deliberately plays this line. I just play the birds, I should study it. So this is the problem with f4. Assuming white doesn't want to play the gambit line, it's easy to miss in this position on f6 to play f4, which looks good. But, and of course, on f4, if pawn takes, he captures with the d pawn. This is also problematic. The problem with this move is bishop c5. And all of a sudden, a fantastic open diagonal for the bishop. How can white castle? Knight b3, bishop b6. And it's just, there's no good way of getting, uh, blocking this diagonal. So that's why f4 is just not a good move for white. So what should white do according to theory? According to theory, white should capture. Now, black has two ways of recapture with the queen or knight. And I've seen some masters that they constantly play queen takes. It's OK, it's playable. But I personally prefer knight takes because this is my worst place piece right now. So black captured with the knight and <coughs> white castles. So as soon as this pawn, which was acting as a wedge in black's position, is gone, black quickly puts pieces in the squares that this pawn used to control. So bishop d6 and white knight f3. So you see harmonious development for both sides. P4 
pieces are all good on the board except this piece, which inherently in French defense is bad. So that's the problem piece in French defense. It has a purely defensive role, and it's defending a backward pawn. This pawn, by definition, is backward. In order for a pawn to be called backward, it has to meet three criteria. Number one, it has to be exposed on a half-open file, which it is. Number two, the pawn, this pawn, cannot be defended with another pawn. You see, black has pushed his d-pawn on f-pawn, so there's no pawn supporting it. And number three, cannot be advanced without losing, losing something. So in this position, after bishop d6, knight f3, it's black's move. Black can push and get rid of the backward pawn, but then it creates another problem. He's going to end up with an IQP, isolated queen pawn. And this pawn is, black has to defend this bad pawn for the rest of the game. So the theory considers after knight f3, two main continuations for black. Either queen b6, which is the, was the old popular line, or the queen c7, the new popular line. Years ago, when this was, even when queen b6 was most, more popular, for some reason I like queen c7 better. Because sometimes this queen from b6 gets dislodged after knight here, knight here, and goes back to c7 anyway. So why not voluntarily go and stay at c7 to begin with? You don't have to go here and come back. So this is all book so far. It's white to play now. And white, this is black's star piece. And white would love to trade his, this dark square bishop with this dark square bishop. So how can he possibly do that? There's a way to do this. You first uh, pin the horse bish, to and G5. Then, and then you bring it back to... Exactly. Bishop g5, bishop h4, bishop g3. And if this bishop is gone or traded with this bishop, that means this square is going to be even weaker, right? Because this bishop is having an eye on this right now. So I played bishop g5. This is our book. So far, we probably spent less than five minutes each. When in a typical game that you may not be familiar with opening, and this is move 12, each side could, have, could spend an hour to find these moves if they had to find it on their own. So black castles, and white continues his routine, which is bishop h4. So in the old days, mid-80s, black used to play g6 here. And on bishop here, trade bishops and queen g7. Fianchelo in the queen. But Korsnoy around that time find a new move for black in this position. And ever since then, everyone plays that move. And it's actually very logical. What is white's plan? To bring the bishop here so and trade it with this five. bishop. And black wants to prevent it. So knight h5. Right, knight h5. But then knight h5, that means this pawn is not guarded. And this knight is kind of under attack indirectly with this queen from here. Yes, there are a couple of pieces on the way for now, but uh, this is always in the air. Bishop takes, knight check, maybe queen here. Look, I mean, F8 takes knight in F3, which is also in the air. That's another one, right. So after knight H5, it's white to play. The correct move that uh, they recommend for white to play is rook C1 and rook e1 later on. You, knight c3 is also perfectly good with this idea. But uh, black simply plays a6, and this knight is kind of misplaced. But in this game, he played a move that I'd never seen before. He played queen c2. And I kind of figured that he must be out of book already. This is a move that he found on his own. And I was trying to find the refutation of this move. What could possibly be the refutation? g6 looks good, but it doesn't work. Because after bishop takes, takes, queen takes, if I bring the knight and save the knight to g7, then he plays knight g5, and the game is over. I'm going to get made it. So what should black do? h6 is the only sensible move. And even though it weakens these squares, it puts an end to whatever white is hoping to do here. So I play h6. He gave this check, so I played king h8. This is a move that usually black voluntarily plays, even without any provocation. King h8, and now he played bishop g6. The check was bad, by the way. He should have saved that for the right time. 
So what's the point of bishop g6? Attacking the knight. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed the move earlier. Let me go back. After bishop g5 castles, white played rook c1. Now rook c1. And black played bishop d7. Rook c1 was a good way to move. The move that I thought he should have played, he actually played it. The point of bishop e7 to reroute the bishop to e8 and eventually around here somewhere. So after bishop d7, bishop h4. Why, is, why is the, the, the c1 look a good move in there? Because this knight is frozen here. I can't move the knight. He pins the knight. Right. And in some lines, this rook part, he wants to move the bishop back. And you see bishop is in the game and rook is in the game. And go queen here, for example, with a mate threat. Or here, hoping to do something over here. And queen in front of the bishop. So he wants to develop the rook, bishop, rook first and then bishop back. So after bishop d7, he played bishop h4. And black played knight h5 to prevent bishop g3. And now he played queen c2. And of course, black played h6. So he gave the check. King h8, and now bishop g6. After the game, he said he overlooked my next move. And black has an easy way of dealing with this bishop. What do you think black should do here? Bishop e8? Exactly. You see, this is my bad bishop, hemmed in because of his pawn. This is his good bishop opposite color of his central pawn. So trading these is strategically is in black's favor. And of course, if he trades, rook takes, it brings my last rook to the game, and black is actually better developed than white. So I played bishop e8, and he played king h1. At first, I couldn't understand this move. You see, he's over 2,400, and there, there's a saying, if somebody all of a sudden in the middle of the game makes a king move and you have a hard time figuring that out, either the guy is under 2400, under 1400, or over 2400. So I knew this guy was over 2400. So I was trying to figure out what could possibly be the point of this move. Anyway, I couldn't find, and I still I checked the reference book in this opening, and there is no King Gates 1 at this point. I figured probably he wants to move this knight at some point. I either want to check. And of course, if he moves the knight, and I play bishop takes, then it would be a mistake because he can trap the bishop. It's not with check. So that's what I figured he's probably trying to do. But it still overall was not a good move, king h1. So it's black to play. I'll be happy to trade these bishops. I'll play bishop takes. He took with the queen. And of course, what's the move now? Queen f7. Josh is a young player, a little bit younger than me. so. Younger players don't have much experience in ending. Ending is something that it takes years to master. So I'll be happy to go into an ending, queenless ending, and hopefully to outplay him. So he traded, uh, he should not have traded, but he did. Queen takes queen, rook takes. And now it makes it a lot easier for more experienced player to play on the disposition on the black side. So he played rook c3. This is another idea behind that rook move. Rook sometimes swings back and piled up against this, this weak pawn. So I play rook c3. Black to play. If I wait another couple of moves, uh, he's going to pile up against this pawn, and I'm going to have to dis defend this bad pawn for the rest of the game. So I decided to push the pawn now. I got rid of my backward pawn. Now this pawn, which by definition is IQP, by definition it's also a pass pawn. So it has potentials. So I play e5, and in virtually all lines of French defense, if black gets to play e5, his improve, position drastically improves. So he took, knight takes, and he traded knights also. After all, I may capture here twice. So knight takes, bishop takes, and by doing so, my bishop came to a great square. 
So now he played rook c5. OK, this move has all the looks of a good move. I cannot play rook d8 because of this bishop, and the pawn is hanging. And if I attack the bishop, he may even play rook takes. I take this bishop, he takes this bishop, and he wins the pawn. So what should black do? Exactly. I'll take the b2 pawn. So what I did in effect is trade my weak pawn, I, my isolated queen pawn, against this pawn here. And by doing so, doing that, I just created a majority on the queen side of the board, two to one. So I played bishop takes b2, he plays rook takes d5, and now he is on my knight. It makes a huge difference when you're under attack or you're about to become a defensive player or defensive, make defensive moves, how to continue. For example, I made a decision here that uh, he had completely overlooked my next move. It's a good idea, by the way, to discuss the game with your opponent af afterwards in the postmortem. Whether you won, lost, or drew, or whether he's high rate or you are, you always learn something new. So instead of typical ways that black defends this knight somehow, you see I have several options, knight here, knight here. Instead, I made an attacking move. My worst piece, least developed, all of a sudden, if these knights get traded, my worst piece, which was an a8 last move, becomes my, my star piece. So I play rook e8, and sure enough, he took this knight, and I took his rook. You see, the position all of a sudden is in big time in black's favor. So how do we assess the position? Usually after a series of exchanges, it's a good idea to assess the position. So who is better, why? So in assessing a position, there are five factors that we look at. And of course, once you do a thorough assessment of the position, it's time for planning, execute uh, to formulate a plan. <coughs> Each side has two rooks, dark square bishop, and four pawns. So material is not a factor. A space. OK, white pieces are over here, but black also has a rook on the seventh. It's more or less equal, maybe slightly black because that rook on the seventh, that ties up this rook over here. Uh, pawn structure, two-point islands each side. The difference is black has distant majority. Distant means away from the kings. Queenside majority is one of the good advantages to have as far as pawn structure goes. As far as activity, more or less looks equal, but definitely position of this rook is better than this rook over here with no threats. So black may be slightly better, and this two to one is the only thing that if black has a win, it'd be probably through that majority on the queen side. And king safety, both kings are relatively safe, not a factor. So in this position, <coughs> it's white to play, and white played f3. So the moment you see this move, f3, Quickly, you think about somehow taking advantage of this weakness. Maybe double a rook on the seventh. So that was my plan. So I play rook d7. And rook here would be devastating. Because if he plays, say, rook g1 to defend it, I can always play bishop here. Rook d7, it's white to play. He played rook b5, attacking the bishop and the pawn. Both are guarded, nothing to worry about. His rook is fairly well placed, and I wanted to drive this rook away with tempo. In other words, advance these pawns, forcing him to waste moves. So a6. This is a move that I can get away with. And if he ever plays the rook to a dark square, then at the right time, I have this opportunity. Right? So on a6, he played rook b3. Perfectly good move. And now I played b5. By playing this move, I took the scope of this rook away. So this rook only has one square to go. Not that I can take advantage of it and win the rook somehow, but I seriously limited the scope of this rook. And as long as this bishop is guarded, I'm going to keep it there unless he 
doubles up on this, that even in that case, I could double up too. So he played rook b3, is blacked after b5, it's his move, and yes, he did play rook b1. So what should black do? I can play this rook here and defend it, but he could play bishop here, harassing the rook. But then I can play rook here, and I didn't see anything more for him, so I played it. So now black is clearly better. This rook only has one square to go. This rook, not much activity, and this one is hanging right now. So what should he do? He obviously cannot defend this pawn, so he played bishop g3. So you have to wonder, when you're playing senior master, those guys are very tricky. There's a saying, a master never gives you a pawn for free. Well, looks like he just gave me one. So I have to think hard, and it's a little bit embarrassing to lose to your own student also. Make sure you don't do that. But is this really truly a free pawn, or is this a poisonous pawn somehow? I looked and looked and looked, and I didn't see anything wrong with not capturing it. So I took. And of course, now bishop has to have an eye on this pawn. That means must stay on this diagonal. So black is clearly better here now. Not only has more space, more aggressive position, but he's also a pawn up. So materially and space-wise, black is clearly better. But it's not so easy to win this position still. So, what did he do? He played rook e3. Now he's looking for counterattack. He figured my king is fairly naked around here, and with the one rook, maybe two rooks, and bishop, he's tr hoping to create some accident or maybe, maybe go after those pawns. So on rook e3, what did I do? I played bishop b4. Just putting my bishop on a good diagonal for now. And also exposing this pawn now. So he goes, if he goes after my A pawn, I can take this pawn. Bishop d4, and he played rook e4. Okay, this is about the only move that he could play. He has to have an eye on that bishop, so I won't be able to win this pawn now. On rook e4, the game lasted eight more moves from here. You guys care to guess Black's moves? I would love to take this pawn, but for the moment I cannot. I also like to advance these pawns, but for the moment I cannot. So what one move prepares for advancing this pawn as well as being able to take this pawn? Bishop c3. Exactly. Bishop c3. And looks like he's gonna move, lose this pawn by force now. It's right to play unless he advances the A pawn, one or two squares. So he advanced two squares. Another important decision. Should black take or push? Both are very tempting because the risk of pushing is that this pawn may fall. He can just chase that pawn and maybe win it, right? And if I take, after take, rook takes, I can play a4 followed by bishop here, and that looks okay, but uh, looks like the pawn can advance much further. So I decided to push, b4. Now I have a very good pass pawn, and it's just a matter of trading rooks, and the ending should win. So I played rook e6, he went after my a pawn. <coughs> What should black play here? A5. A5, good, obvious. But of course, he's really gonna go after that pawn. Rook A6. So if I wanted to just defend that pawn, I could play rook here and guard it. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that because this rook's hanging. So on rook A6, is black to play, what should he do? Right now, this is my ace this pawn to the point that I'm willing to give up this pawn and make something out of this pawn rook b2 rook b2 and he figured he's winning a pawn so why not he traded rooks rook takes rook takes 
and he won the pawn. Okay, so he equalized the position materially. We both have a pass pawn. Mine is a little bit more advanced, but the game actually lasted three more moves from here. In other words, it's black to play and win. I could have given a check, but I pushed this pawn because not only advances the pawn one square closer to queen, <coughs> but also exposes his rook to my bishop. So I played rook b5. And now rook b1, check, king g2, and beat b2. And now he cannot even sack this bishop for that pawn. He will have to sack a whole rook. And this is the moment that he resigned. Because the idea is to go here next and just queen the pawn to a light square. He has to give up a whole rook for it and the game would be totally lost. So, long live French. Hope you enjoyed it. That was the first game. Shall we? That was also French, yeah. That opening was French too. But since this was against one of my own students who is uh, higher rated than me right now, I figured I'd show this game. Should we continue or take a break? Take a break.